It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Where does the modern understanding of what we call vampires originate? Is it just lore, or do vampires have a foothold in reality? What does scripture tell us about the consumption of blood, and how does this relate to the fallen celestial beings? Join us as we investigate the esoteric origins of blood rituals and how Hollywood has glamorized this practice in the media we consume. Vampires Forever Young beautiful, powerful. These are many of the adjectives people associate with these shadowy figures of the night. A creature of legend that has been beautified by Hollywood to represent everything you could desire. To be the ultimate outsider. And that's something that resonates so much with so many of us. In recent years, vampires have reached all new heights of popularity spurred on by an onslaught of television, books, games, and movies. If it bleeds, it leads, and obviously a vampire story is going to bleed. What was once the stuff of nightmares, now the fetish of modern America. Yet for some, the word vampire rings a different tune. A reality that lurks beneath the surface of our society embedded deep within the esoteric workings of Satanism and the occult. Are vampires real? And what influence on our society do they have? You aren't drinking anything but blood. It's forbidden in, in the Bible to drink blood. Certainly there's a tie to the occult. It's appealing and it's romantic. Whether people are attracted to the occult and then vampirism, or whether people are attracted to vampirism and then the occult, or whether they happen at roughly the same time, I think that's unique to the individual. What is real vampirism?
someone who not only knows the difference between cosplayers and legitimate bloodsuckers, but has a profound understanding of the occult grooming it takes to become a legitimate vampire because he lived it. His name is William Snowblin. As a witch, I got involved ultimately in the Church of Satan because the guy who owned the occult bookstore in Milwaukee there turned me on to it. I read the Satanic Bible, joined the Church of Satan, and pretty much discovered it was kind of, it sounds funny, but kind of Satanism light, L-I-T-E. It was really, and I think for the same reason that Michael Aquino, who was a high-level member of the Church of Satan, left it, I left it. And I got involved with a group called the Order of the Black Ram over in Michigan. And then I got involved with the Brotherhood down in Chicago, which is really hardcore stuff. And that's when I when I sold my soul to the devil. Because believe it or not, the Church of Satan doesn't teach people to sell their souls to the devil. It's kind of like, you know, Satan's a counterfeiter. He can't come up with a thing that's original because Yahweh is the source of all ideas and creative power. So as a counterfeit to being born again, um, the evil one has you make a commitment to him by basically selling your soul to him. You sign in your name in this black book in your own blood and you swear that you know, for seven years, you will serve the evil one, Hasatan, and in return, he will give you your heart's desires, whatever they might be, you know, wine, women, song, drugs, power, whatever. You get whatever you want. And then at the end of that time, he gets to kill you and take you to hell. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like a really good deal, you know, but you see, you've got to realize Satanists believe that heaven is for losers. That all you do in heaven is sit around on a dumb cloud and twang a harp. That's it. Whereas they believe hell is like, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll for all eternity. That's what they believe. They believe it's like going to be an orgy with dope and whatnot, you know, going on forever and ever and ever. They believe that, you know, in order to be powerful, either as a politician or as a banker or whatever it might be, that you have to serve Satan. That you have to sell your soul to Satan. And the other thing is that part of this contract was is that if I was a really good Satanist, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, but if I got seven people to sign their souls to the devil under my administration, then I would be given an extension on the contract for another seven years for me to gain more power and, and kind of pile up more bennies for the afterlife. So, basically that's how it works. Do you regard black magic as being purely fictitious or is there some truth in it? Some truth. 100% truth. There is nothing fictitious about black magic in any way whatever. It is a fact. It is a fact which has existed for several thousand years. I mean, when we talk about black magic, we are talking about Satanism, necromancy, alchemy, witchcraft, the worship of uh, Satan, um, the worship of dark forces, whether it's voodoo, juju, whether it's something practiced in the Western world or the Eastern world, uh, whether it's uh, easily defined or not easily defined, the order of the left-hand path, the, the following of this, the following of that. It is basically the worship of the force of evil as embodied by Satan. Lucifer, the princes of darkness and their legions and so on. In a very simple sense, of course, it goes much more deeply than that. It is a fact. It is a desperately dangerous fact. It does exist. It exists around us today. Satanic ceremonies will be happening in Britain tonight. Very definitely. Ask any priest, ask any member of the forces of law and order, and they will tell you that Satanism as such, it's there. I was told after I got through the first couple of years, if you really want to get into it, you've got to go from being an adeptus major, which is a rank within the occult world, to being an adeptus exemptus. And that means I had to make this choice. I either had to go the route of lycanthropy or the route of vampirism. 
Now, lycanthropy is basically, for the layman, it means being a werewolf or a shapeshifter. So, I decided to go the vampire one. The only question, what would it cost William to become a vampire? I am David Carrico of Followers of Jesus Christ Ministry in Evansville, Indiana. Our ministry has dealt with satanic ritual abuse and blood drinking, secret societies and cults since the early 90s. And in our ministry, we have encountered many groups and individuals that have been involved in the consumption of blood. In the modern groups and individuals that are still continuing the practice of blood sacrifice and blood drinking, Aleister Crowley, the father of modern Satanism, would be at the top of the list. And Mr. Crowley, in his book called Book Four, he talks about the bloody sacrifice and how it is to be conducted. And it's absolutely amazing that these things could ever be put in print. And as the head of the Ordo Templar Orientis and its sister group, the Golden Dawn, it's easy to see the tremendous potential for all people that are fascinated with Aleister Crowley of becoming involved in these blood sacrifice, blood drinking rituals. But this is what Mr. Crowley states on page 207 of book four. It would be unwise to condemn as irrational the practice of those savages who tear the heart and the liver from an adversary and devour them while yet warm. In any case, it was the theory of the ancient magicians that any living being is a storehouse of energy, varying in quantity according to the size and health of the animal, and in quality according to its mental and moral character. At the death of the animal, this energy is liberated suddenly. And this is the idea between modern, of modern Satanism. And it's the same idea that came from the ancient mystery religions, the same concept. About 110 years ago, a little more, Crowley had this revelation, supposedly. And he, he's by, regarded by many people as the most influential black magician of the 20th century. He called himself the Great Beast. And he had this revelation from this being, Iwas, got this book called the Book of the Law. And supposedly this was a communication from what he called a greater human intelligence, or as a demon, about how the age of Christ, of the slain and risen God, was going to draw to a close in 1904. And that a new aeon was going to begin, and that aeon was the aeon of Horus the crowned and conquering child. And Crowley was supposed to be his prophet, just like, you know, Muhammad was the prophet of the Quran and, and um, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Yahushua, and, you know, so on and so on. So Crowley was supposedly the, the prophet of this new age, and he called it, Crowley did, the age of the fascinating child. And Crowley was bisexual. He was probably a pedophile. And, you know, he bragged about murdering 150 children, male children, in one year to do a certain magical ritual, whether he was just being weird or whether he really did it. I mean, who knows? But the point is, I think when he did this working in Cairo, it's called the Cairo working, where he, he got this book of the law, I think he unleashed, remember this guy was a very high level Freemason. He unleashed a whole new level of depravity into the spiritual environment of the world. Now, he goes on to say on page 207 of, Vic, of book four, for the highest spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force, a male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. And there's an unbelievable, if that isn't unbelievable enough, there's a footnote in this book that says, 
It appears from the magical records of Father Perdabo, which was another name Crowley called himself, that he made this particular sacrifice an average about 150 times every year between 1912 and 1928. Now that is one dedicated Satanist. That's unbelievable. But that's how dedicated Crowley was to this blood ritual. And it's easy to see when people become involved in the Order Templar Orientis and Golden Dawn, which of course they're going to say, they're not going to come out and say that we sacrifice human beings. They're going to say it's all symbolic. But it's easy to see the plain language Crowley uses. And when people begin to read and follow this stuff, the end result's very predictable. On page 208, he says, those magicians who object to the use of blood have endeavored to replace it with incense. But the bloody sacrifice, though more dangerous, is more efficacious, and for nearly all purposes, human sacrifice is the best. You know, all of this was started, I think, by Crowley through the Freemasons. So I think it's a profound connection there, and I think it's why we've just watched this spread enormously in our culture in the last 50 to 75 years. Because Crowley died in 47, and his legacy lives on. He's more popular today than he was in his own lifetime, because basically he died a lone, penniless heroin addict you know, in England in 47, and yet nowadays he's got, ten, because partly the internet, you know, and the fact that his books are being published, he's got thousands, tens of thousands of followers who are praying to this deity, invoking this Iwas and this Horus and Rehur Kuit and Hur Parkrat and all this garbage. So Mr. Crowley minces no words. Human sacrifice is the best, more dangerous, oh yeah, but this is how far they go. They, it's, it's literally a handbook on ritual human sacrifice that says a male child of perfect innocence is the best way to go. This is why there's such a strong connection, this and many other reasons we could talk about, that there's such a strong connection between Freemasonry and satanic ritual abuse. And this is what Mr. Crowley called true Freemasonry. To further his involvement in the occult, which in many ways paralleled the path advocated by Aleister Crowley, William chose to become a sanguinarian, or more simply put, a vampire. And so I petitioned the, the Brotherhood to go that way. The sanguinarian vampire, uh, they may believe themselves to be deficient in a certain mineral or a small collection of minerals that can only be satisfied by consuming blood. Or they may think that consuming human blood, specifically human blood, gives them some sort of a, a psychic boost. And from that, they're able to perceive the world differently or maybe the way that it's supposed to be seen. And I had a visitation of what I now believe is a fallen angel because this guy he was ice cold. I mean, if you were to lay his, your hand on the guy's chest, it was like a marble statue. And I think it was a fallen angel. I don't think it was a vampire. I think it was a fallen angel because people need to understand something. The way fallen angels fall is by drinking human blood. Could fallen angels have been the originators of blood rituals? That's how they fall. That because fallen angels the larger reason why they fall is they want girls. <laughs> Fallen angels want human women. And the devil does something, whispers in their ear, makes them want to have relations with a mortal woman. But angels can't do that. The only way angels can do that is if they drink human blood. And then once they do, they have to keep doing it. Or otherwise they lose their power to, to have sexual relations. Were these beings primordial vampires? And why would these entities desire and crave blood from their human worshipers? 
And if we think about it, and if we just put four scriptures together, this will make a lot of sense real quick. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. And this tells us very plainly that to go into the eternal state in the third heaven above the firmament, that we cannot do so in a flesh and blood body. Now, another scripture in Luke 24, 39, Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Jesus' resurrected body was flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. He shed his blood on Calvary. And he, in his resurrection appearances, he stated clearly he had a flesh and bone, not a flesh and blood body. And in Philippians 3.21, the Apostle Paul tells us that our resurrected body will be like Jesus' resurrected body, flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. In in Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And one more scripture will tell us that the angels also have a flesh and bone body. In Luke chapter 20, verse 35 and 36, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So in our flesh and bone resurrected state, we will be equal to the angels who would also have to have a flesh and bone, not a flesh and blood body. So from this, we can conclude blood, the life is the blood. The blood is what enables us to exist in this world we live in. But we must get rid of that blood to exist in the third heaven above the firmament. So when the fallen angels came down in a flesh and bone body, what did they need? to be able to carry on and function in the way that they wanted to in this world. Blood. Therefore, the offering of the blood in uh, under these creatures and to their offspring, they needed blood. And when the blood was offered to these creatures, they could then participate and interact with the human race in the ungodly ways that they desired. Many ancient civilizations talk about fallen celestial beings coming down and cohabitating with the daughters of men. And it might be a big pill to swallow to believe that fallen angels would want to interact with human females, but it is very plausible that ancient vampires were the fallen angels of old. I think the source origin of the whole vampire mythos down through the centuries, probably all the way back, to the time of, you know, the flood, is these fallen angels that occasionally show up on the scene and want to reproduce, and they have to drink human blood to do it, and it's become part of the, um, of the, of the culture. It's incredible to see the historical connection between blood rituals and what we understand today as vampirism. You'll find that every culture on Earth, African, Asian, Latin American, you know, they all have a vampire. You might call it something different, but they all have a vampire. And it's the same deal. It's a, an immortal being that drinks human blood to live forever. The real apex predator, right? So now humans are not the top dog on the planet. There's something above and beyond even ordinary humans. And I think that that is something that people who are drawn to the the vampire lifestyle and particularly the blood consuming aspect of the vampire lifestyle that is uh, something that resonates very strongly with them and, and and again they're part of this ancient thread that connects 
modern culture to some of the earliest observations that human beings made. From the testimony of William and also many other occultists who go the route of blood rituals, what is the process that someone has to undertake in order to become a vampire? And this being told me what I had to do, and I'm not going to talk about all of it because I don't want people going out and trying to do it, but uh, part of it involved ingesting enormous amounts of cocaine. Enormous. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much cocaine. Uh, this is before there was crack. I think maybe crack was just starting to come on the scene, but it was it was pure cocaine, dozens of lines, and um, never affected me because this this fallen celestial being was doing something. So anyhow, after I think it was about a three month period, I was ready. And I had my own little weird chapel in our home where we live. And he appears. And he's this tall, ivory-skinned dude. Looks kind of like what you're expecting a vampire to look like. And basically, we did this ritual. He ripped open his chest, and I drink, drank his blood, and he drank my blood. And then I had to lay in a coffin. And I had, I had to build my own coffin according to certain specifications. And then at the end of that time, three days, I emerged just like, you know, I was told, well, because I was told that, that, that Yahushua, Jesus, was a vampire. That's how he rose from the dead after three days. You know, you'd be amazed what, and they, they built this whole elaborate mythology around this stuff, because the devil can twist scripture for his own purposes, you know. In order to learn more about William's story, we traveled next to New Orleans, the vampire capital of the United States. Well, my name is Lisa Andreessen. I'm a tour guide for Haunted History Tours, and we walk through the darkened residential streets of the French Quarter, and we talk about vampires. We talk about folklore, myth, tradition. We talk about the plausible origin of vampire stories in New Orleans. We talk about the roots of vampire stories globally. We talk about some true crime that has some vampiric overtones, and the entire tour is sort of structured as a story itself. And by the end, I want people to understand not just a little more, a little bit more about vampires. I want people to understand a little bit more about what it means to be human. Because ultimately, vampire stories are stories that were invented by humans, and they're stories about humans, about human communities, about human monsters, about human societies. When we're starting in the shadow of the oldest continually operating Catholic cathedral in the United States of America, the St. Louis Cathedral, and the city of New Orleans was established in the year 1718, one of the oldest uh, cities in the United States of America, but we're hardly American. We were established as a French colony in the year 1718. It's worth noting that the word vampire was first formally recorded in France in the year 1692. That's not the year that vampire stories arrived in France. That's the year that people started writing about vampire stories in France. When you look at the population, that became the first colonists here in New Orleans. They were the gullible, the superstitious, the poorly educated, culled from Parisian prisons, and they brought their stories and their folklore with them. While we don't have documented evidence that they brought vampire stories with them, the overwhelming likelihood is that they might have. And if that's the case, then the vampire might be one of the oldest and most ancient boogeymen that we've had to deal with on the streets here in New Orleans. In 1976, Anne Rice penned Interview with the Vampire set largely in Creole, New Orleans. And from that launching point came many other books written by Rice herself and other writers. As time went by, the city of New Orleans sort of developed this reputation as a mecca for vampire stories and those who identify as vampires. Most of these individuals, they find that engaging in, in, in blood play or blood consumption um, fulfills some sort of a, of a deeply rooted psychological need. And some would even say it's a deeply rooted psychic need, which dovetails a little bit with, with psychic vampirism as well. You know, I, I think that they're two sides of the same coin. The ingestion of blood has been a prevalent aspect of occult practices for millennia. 
The idea of blood drinking to prolong your life is a very, very ancient idea. And it's why almost all ancient cultures did it. I mean, you know, most of the cultures that surrounded Israel uh, would drink human blood. And of course, we understand, like in the New World, uh, so-called, you know, like the Aztecs and the Toltecs. I mean, you would not believe how many thousands of people the Aztecs killed as part of their, and they'd rip out the heart and they'd drink the blood. And this is all, I mean, this is like a, an almost universal archetypal practice in pagan cultures. The idea that, the, you know, as it says in the scriptures, the blood is the life. If you could accept that a vampire is an entity that derives its sustenance from vital human life force energy, then there were ancient Assyrian vampires. There were ancient Egyptian vampires. The vampire is one of the oldest archetypical villains that the human race has had to deal with. Almost all ancient cultures practice blood drinking. And this was propagated throughout the Middle East through the mystery religions. Vampire stories as we know them, uh, the European, the Eastern European vampire story, most of those trace their roots to blood cults along the Hindus River Valley in the last two or three centuries before the Common Era. This can be documented from the rites of Tammuz and the rites of Dionysus and the rites of all these mystery cults. These mystery cults were known by different names in different countries and all through a false communion, if you will. They practiced cannibalism and the drinking of blood. Uh, a book that documents this is a book called Who Was Hiram Abiff? that is published by the McCoy Masonic Publishing Company. And in regards to the rites of Tammuz in Syria, it says there was a sacramental feast which at first consisted of the body of the slain god, probably broiled in the cauldron to which our attention has been directed. Later bread, representing the flesh, and wine, representing the blood, were certainly substituted. Probably the bread originally consisted of the obscene cakes, and the wine was what was left over after a portion had been poured as a libation to a starte. The corpse, real or substitute was regularly mourned by the people for three days during which time the divine soul was supposed to be in the underworld. So sometimes representing the real corpse they would use the bread and the wine, sometimes a real corpse, sometimes animal, sometimes human. And this was devoured in much the same way that Christians were, would partake the Lord's Supper and they believed that this sacramentally would put them into communion with their God. And this was practiced in the Italian and the Greek and the uh, Syrian mysteries all over uh, the known world at that time. And in the rites of Dionysus, it says concerning these rites, in these secret rites, a bull dressed up in human clothing was torn to pieces and eaten by the frenzied devotees. And there is little doubt that it originally was a man, the human representative of Dionysus, who thus perished. As the dismembered carcass of the bull was eaten raw by the worshipers, there is no doubt that the sacramental feast, for such it was, was originally a cannibalistic meal. So all through the mystery rites, this cannibalistic sacramental eating of blood was practiced to bring them into communion with God. And there was also the belief that through the eating of the flesh and the actual drinking of the blood that they obtained the power and the abilities of the human or the animal that they ate. It's interesting to me, when you, when you study color theory across language groups, you'll notice that as words for color evolve in languages, you have first words for light and dark, and then almost universally, the next color is red. Red is such a powerful, potent color. Why? Because early humans realized if you lose enough blood, you are going to die. So obviously, pre-modern, um, societies or just any um, group that, that, that maybe doesn't have as, as firm a grasp of medical science 
uh, as others do, that's a very intuitive, organic conclusion to jump to that if you lose a lot of blood that you will die, then perhaps if you consume the blood of your enemies, you will be able to um, take on a bit of their strength, a bit of their power. And not only was this in the mystery rites, but because this is the basic religion of the fallen angels that came down through Cain, this is practiced worldwide. You can see it in South America, you can see it in the Asian cultures, and in the Golden Bough, by Sir James George Fraser, he talks about how this was practiced in Southeast Africa. He says again, the flesh and blood of dead men are commonly eaten and drunk to inspire bravery, wisdom, and other qualities for which the men themselves were remarkable or which are supposed to have their special seat in the particular part eaten. Thus among the mountain tribes of southeastern Africa, there are ceremonies by which the youths are formed into guilds or lodges, and among the rites of initiation, there is one which is intended to infuse courage, intelligence, and other qualities into the novices. So there was this understanding globally that through drinking the blood of an animal or human, and eating the specific body part for the quality you want, you could infuse this energy and ability into yourself. And they migrated out of the Indian subcontinent into Eurasia a thousand years ago, um, migrating with populations of the, the, the Romani, the Roma, sometimes pejoratively known as the gypsies. And I only say that word because so many people don't know uh, what I mean when I say the Roma. And so these uh, families and these groups and these communities, they began to arrive in Eastern Europe roughly around times of, say, the Crusades. And they brought their stories with them like you do. And these are really the origins of so many of the Eastern European vampire stories that we know. Not just vampire, of course, you also have the Lamia, the Strigoi, the Strega, the Upir of the Russian steppes. You have uh, Nosferatu himself. It's really important to understand that not all vampire stories use the word vampire. Without fail, all of these examples of historical vampirism were intended to produce some sort of long life or vitality in those who consumed the blood of their victims. The most famous story would be of the Countess Elizabeth Bathory, who was a uh, Eastern European noblewoman who was obsessed with staying young. And the story is that, that you know, she was this really cruel, cruel woman. And, and her handmaiden was doing something to her hair and she didn't like it and she, she seized the razor that the woman was using to trim her hair and slashed at the woman, basically killed her on the spot because she did something wrong to her hair. And the woman, you know, if you cut an artery, the whoosh, you know, the blood comes out and it, it splashed all over the, the countess's uh, arms and whatever. And when she rubbed it off, she noticed her arms looked younger. And so she gets that said, what if I bathe in the blood of virgins? As far as anybody knows, this woman is probably the most profound serial killer in the entire history of Western civilization. She killed hundreds of young girls and bathed in their blood. And eventually she was caught, even though she was a noble woman, she couldn't get away with it forever. And they ended up, you know, I guess they killed her and executed her mother. So they called her the Blood Countess. Countess Elizabeth Bathory, someone who was obsessed with blood rituals. Reportedly murdering over 600 young women between 1585 and 1609. The stories of her serial murders and brutality are verified by the testimony of more than 300 witnesses. So how did these gruesome stories evolve into the media that we consume today? 
This was a slow, gradual evolution. The first English language vampire story was published in the year 1820 by Dr. John Polidori. He based it on Lord Byron. Polidori was Byron's own personal physician. And so Count Ruthven, Lord Ruthven in The Vampire, the 1820 novel, is this ruthless, sadistic killer who preys on virginal young women and he gives money to gamblers and alcoholics so that they can ruin themselves with their own vices. And this is what the vampire was to the uh, English gentlemen of the early 19th century. As the Victorian era progressed, you have Varney the Vampire, which was a series of penny dreadfuls that was published for several uh, years in the middle of the 19th century. Century. And, and this kind of explores the, the vampire as sort of this, um, just this, this, this hokey sort of a villain almost. Uh, Irish writer Sheridan Le Fanu writes Carmilla in the year 1871, and it's a short story, but it really inspired Dracula tremendously. Uh, Fanu and, and Stoker uh, were, were countrymen. Now we return to William's story and what it was like to be a practicing vampire. Well, so at the end of that time, I come out and um, I can't go out uh, during the daytime without like being covered up. I, I had this old Amish hat from when I was a druid, you know, the kind of hats the Amish men wear. I'd, I'd have, in the dead of summer, I'd have I'd wear, you know, long sleeve shirts and this big Amish hat if I went outside during the day, because otherwise I'd blister in the sunlight. I had to wear gloves. I couldn't go within a hundred feet of garlic. And um, I lived on human blood and Catholic communion. That's all I ate. I, have, I, I would celebrate, I was told, celebrate a mass. I mean, what does that tell you about the Catholic Church? You know, but I, I was a priest. In fact, I was a bishop in the Gnostic Catholic Church. And so I did a mass every every day and I would drink because see, here's the thing, Catholic theology teaches that when you eat the bread and drink the wine, you're drinking the entire body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. As we discuss these topics and we think about them, one thing that would come to mind is how does this relate to our participation in the celebration of communion and the Lord's Supper? and Biblically, this is symbolic. When we would take of the bread and the juice or the wine, this symbolizes the body and the blood of Jesus that was slain on the cross for us. Now, in the Catholic Church, they call their Mass transubstantiation. And in this Mass, they make the claim that when the priest pronounces his word over the the bread and the wine and he does his little signal and says Mysterium Fide, they say that it actually changes into real blood. Now you look at it and it doesn't change, but they're telling you that it really changes into blood, that you're drinking the blood of Jesus. Now if all you have to know is Acts 15:20. Or Leviticus 17, we are not to drink blood. A true believer will not take the Catholic communion because we do not drink blood. And so that would slake some of my vampiric thirst to drink Christ's blood. But it wasn't enough. And so fortunately, I had this network of <clears throat> covens under me because I'd initiated like over 175 women. And some of them had risen up in the ranks to the point where they wanted me to drink their blood. And so different nights, I'd have different women come in and I'd drink their blood. In the sanguinarian community, you, you have the actual sanguinarians and you have the donors. And, and you have people who don't identify as vampires, but they do identify as those who will let those who consume blood consume their blood. And so I think that there's 
almost equally a number of people who want to be the vampire as there are the people who want to be fed upon by the vampire. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any shortage of willing donors. Pop culture has often associated many things with being a vampire, but William in his personal experience went through some things you would have never expected. Life was not always as easy as order and food. And I'll tell you, you know, there's a reason why in the Bible we are told don't drink blood, both in the Torah and in the, um, in the even in Noah. Noah was told don't drink blood even before the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. And of course, even in the book of Acts, James says don't drink blood. There's a reason. Blood is profoundly addictive. And in my experience, it's worse than cocaine. And you need more of it. Just like any addiction, you develop a tolerance. And you get more, and you want more, and you want more, and you get more, and, and you know, this is a vicious cycle. And I had, I had a, you know, here's the funny thing. I'm supposedly this great Illuminati vampire dude. I had to get a job putting newspapers in boxes in the middle of the night for the Milwaukee Sentinel. <laughs> How's that for a glamorous, you know, because I can only go out in the daytime. You know, so here I am driving around uh, the north side of Milwaukee at two or three in the morning sometimes, sometimes midnight. And I'd see either, you know, homeless people or the occasional hooker or whatever, and it was all I could do not to jump out of the truck and rip their throat out and drink their blood. Because with these women in my coven, I would, I would try to never drink enough blood to hurt them. At one point, I carried away and actually had the woman pass out on me, which is kind of scary. So, vampires, not as fictional as they've been made out to be. The false immortality offered by occultism is a dangerous pursuit, which finds its beginning in particularly dark accounts. In considering a wider spectrum of the vampire pop culture phenomenon, there are many people who do not practice blood drinking that do condone and consume the media put out by Hollywood, some being captivated enough by vampires to allow others to drink their blood. In our American culture, it is very true to say that many people that would never drink blood themselves condone and propagate this culture that desensitizes our children to blood drinking. The tremendous popularity of the Twilight series would be one example, and of the multitude of vampire TV shows, movies, they just come in an endless stream. My name is Lex Meyer, and I have a ministry called Unlearn the Lies. The idea behind the ministry is to get people to dig deeper into the Word of God, to find out what the truth is, and um, to, to unlearn the lies that we've been told. We cannot be approving of the things that God disapproves of. And by buying a ticket to a movie, or by watching a, a show on TV, or whatever, just, just the idea of us watching and consuming it, being entertained by it, thinking it's funny, thinking it's um, enjoyable. We're taking joy in that. We're taking pleasure in that. We're taking pleasure in sin. We're taking pleasure in the things of this world. We're not supposed to be taking pleasure in the things of this world. We're supposed to be taking pleasure in the things of God. And this fascination with all things occult, from Harry Potter to the Twilight series, this is just enabling our children to come to the place where this just seems natural. And it, it is more than just natural, it's appealing and it's romantic. And it's just a sad testimony to the place that our American culture has come to. Just about any choice that you make in your life, any identity that, I, that you assume in your life can be a stepping point for going beyond and going deeper into uh, different paths, whether you're studying something occult, esoteric, whether you are getting into um, shape-shifting, astral projection. If, if, if that is something that interests you, then, then yes, maybe first identifying as a vampire fan and then identifying as a real vampire. That could be steps along a path towards also identifying as this type of magic user or as, as this type of occultist. For many others, identifying as a vampire is the end of it. That's just, this is who I am, this is what I do, 
And, and that's, that's, that's enough for them. When you add into the equation people who might feel isolated from their families, misunderstood by their families, misunderstood uh, by you know the community that they were born and raised in, then the community of the vampire becomes it becomes a substitute family. And that is, you know, that is very powerful. That's the danger of all this because these books, like the big thing a few years ago was Twilight, that's what inspired me to write my book, Romance and Death. Uh, the Vampire Diaries. Whether it's Dracula, whether it's Interview with a Vampire, whether it's Dead After Dark, whether it's Let the Right One In, and they say, this is me. This is something that I relate to. This is, this is who I am. All these different TV shows and movies that are out there, they all glamorize it. They make, oh, you know, you can live forever and be beautiful and sexy and like, you know, the whole thing, the narrative within the, um, the Twilight thing is this idea that there's this Bella who's sort of this kind of blah, plain, clumsy girl who falls in love with this guy that looks like he's a teenager, but actually he's like 106 years old, he's a vampire. And in the end of the series, she ends up getting him to make her a vampire. And she turns into this gorgeous, beautiful, you know, perpetually young forever. And what young girl wouldn't want that? Because you know, we understand that adolescents of both sexes, but especially girls, are very conscious of how they look, of how their peers view them, and no young person is perfect. They all can find something wrong with them when they look in the mirror. And they, oh, if I could just get some guy to let me have him drink my blood, I could be like Bella, or I could be like the girl on the Vampire Diaries or whatever. The vampire's appeal is universal. Take that the next step, the appeal of Becoming a vampire, wanting to be a vampire, identifying as a vampire is equally as universal. The process of becoming a vampire is beautified by Hollywood. It promises youth and immortality, strength and power, and it draws people in. So this is the danger of it. So we need to underscore the fact that this stuff has spiritual consequences. You know, people who are drawn to the vampire lifestyle and the vampire identity. There's something very compelling about that archetype. Um, and I think it comes down to power. And this is, this is a very common idea. And that's where the whole vampire thing trades on. The idea that if you drink blood, you're basically taking life force from someone, whether you're doing it willingly or unwillingly. And you need to understand, and your listeners need to understand that, you know, there are, in any big city, you will find vampire nightclubs. Just like, you know, there are gay bars. You know, there are vampire bars where you can go and you can hook up with someone for mutually consensual blood drinking. And as bizarre as that sounds, this has been going on for probably 20, 25 years. It used to be underground, now it's above ground. And young people especially, they're the ones that are being courted. Because again, there's this occult idea that the younger the person is you drink the blood, the more energy there is, the more chi, the more life force, whatever word you want to use. And so if you can get a teenager to let you drink their blood, you're going to get a whole lot more energy than if you get somebody who's 40 to let them drink their blood. There are communities online. There are communities online. There are in-person communities as well, vampire courts throughout the United States. Usually you have to know somebody who knows somebody, who can introduce you. The type of people you will find in a vampire community aren't necessarily dissimilar, although they, they might not be the same people, but not necessarily dissimilar to the type of people that you'd find involved in any kink or fetish. The Count has given orders that you should wear this dress tonight. So you find people from all walks of life. There's a reason that the, the vampire in literature and in film has been such an enduring figure. Go ahead, Sylvia. Fight. Why is it so important for us to discern the media that we consume? If you think about it, the Bible over and over tells us that we are to have discernment between the clean and the unclean. If you're not willing to discern between the clean and the unclean media, 
which is an object lesson we learn in scripture first about food. Well, we are consuming food for the health of our body. How much more important is it for the, the health of our soul that we discern between clean and unclean? Because whatever you put into your mind, whatever you feast your eyes on, is in fact what your heart is taking pleasure in. Look at Philippians 4.8. It says, meditate on these things. Whatever is holy, whatever is righteous, whatever is true, whatever is pure, meditate on these things. Think on these things. And so the things that you're looking at and the things that you're watching in media, does it line up with what the Bible says? Is it holy? Is it pure? Is it righteous? Is it clean? Or are you the things that you're putting into your mind, are they things of darkness? Are they things of death? Are they things of evil? And so as you're, you're, you're thinking about this media, we have to have this discernment and say, is this something that God would approve of? Is this something that He would say, let's watch this together? You know, can you imagine Jesus sitting on the couch next to you and watching this movie? What would He say about it? And, and those are the kinds of questions that I think we should be challenging ourselves with. Is, is this something that, uh, that God would approve of? And in the New Testament, as well as the Old, there is a very specific prohibition against the drinking of blood. And this, the context of it in the 15th chapter of Acts is the Apostolic Council. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 20, the scripture says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And the main context of the Apostolic Council was dealing with the problem of how Jews and Gentiles can fellowship together. And in this period, the New Testament was being written and the Old Testament scriptures were all the scriptures that they had. And at this time, after Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius became a believer and thousands of Gentiles began to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, they would go to the Jewish synagogues and in the very next verse, Acts 15, 21, it says, For Moses of old time hath in them every city, them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. And this is the specific context of the prohibition of drinking blood and of the other prohibitions too in Acts 20. How, and it was called the halak, the righteous Gentile. How can a Gentile go to synagogue and be considered righteous to go in and hear the scriptures read on the Sabbath. And there were thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of Gentiles coming to the Lord and pouring in to these synagogues to hear the scriptures read. And this created a major problem. And this was the backdrop of the 15th chapter of Acts, the Apostolic Council. How do Gentiles behave so that they can go into the synagogue and hear the scriptures. And one of the huge things that was absolutely abominable unto the Jews because of the admonitions in Leviticus 17 was not to eat blood. So therefore, it is just as important for us today, and Leviticus 17 is still good for us today. And it's doubly reinforced in Leviticus 17 and Acts 15 we are not to drink blood because it is absolute the foundation of pagan sacrifice under these devils. After all of his investment in the occult, what happened next in William's story was something he would have never expected. So anyway, this is getting pretty serious and it was about this time that I got this uh, check back from the bank from the Church of Satan. And uh, every year I'd send the $20 check to the Church of Satan because I get their newsletter, the Cloven Book. And the woman on the, the apparently the banker at the Church of Satan's bank in San Francisco, because that's when their headquarters was out there, uh, she said, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. And I I was so arrogant, I thought nothing of it, you know. And I threw the check in the bank and the, in my file and forgot about it. 
but literally within two days, it was like I was run over by a truck spiritually. I mean, everything fell apart. I lost my job. I got sick as a dog. I lost all my magical power. And that is what started me on the road away from it. But here's the interesting thing. Because that woman prayed for me, I was delivered from need for blood and for the need for drugs. Just, I never asked for it, but bam, there it was. Yahushua moved in my life in a sovereign way and set me free from that. And I went on to join the Mormon church, spent five years in the Mormon church, and ultimately that's what the Almighty used to get me born again in 1984. For all of those that have become involved in blood drinking, or even with the fascination with it, there is just all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't do it. There's not only the spiritual reasons why you shouldn't do it, but there's obvious health reasons why you shouldn't do it. The transmission of diseases and AIDS, it's just terrifying to think of drinking another human being's blood. And for those that have actually participated in it or even just become fascinated with it, there is forgiveness. This is something that you can repent and be forgiven of. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can be forgiven of it. You can be cleansed of it. Don't feel like you've done something that you can't come back from. Believe me, you can be forgiven. Many people have. So turn to the Lord in faith and repentance and He will forgive and he will cleanse. And plus, you know, the fact of the matter is you're not going to live forever. The only way you're going to live forever is through having saving faith in Yahushua the Messiah, and then you will. When you die, if, if he doesn't come back before you die, you're going to have a glorified, resurrected, immortal body that's going to be a hundred times better than any vampire thing you see, you know, Edward Cullen or whoever it might be. Vampires, not as fictional as they're made out to be. The deception is real, yet tragically many people encourage the adoration of these foul creatures through the media they consume, and simultaneously turn a blind eye to the actual existence of dark occult workings and the connection of ancient blood rituals, very likely initiated by the fallen angels of old. Well, you think about what is a vampire? A vampire, first off, is typically considered an immortal. Well, that's a type of deity. The Bible tells us not to have any other gods before us. That means not to have it in front of us, not to have it in our mind, in our thoughts, in our eyes. What does uh, the average self-identifying, lifestyle, blood-drinking vampire identify as a higher power? It would be the self. So it's, it's a counterfeit, you know, Dracula and the vampire thing is like a black Christ. I mean, racially, but I mean morally, it's like a, an anti-Christ figure because just like, you know, with, with the Messiah, his side was opened up and his blood poured forth so that we can have eternal life. Well, in the same way, Dracula and all these other vampire type archetypes, they cut open their chest and through their blood, you're supposed to get eternal life. He's like a dark Christ thing. And it's, it's a lie. What's the danger of watching media that presents a Messiah type character, another type of Messiah? Well, our Messiah warned us. He said there will be many who come and they will be false Christs, false Messiahs, and they will lead many astray. Something that completely contradicts scripture, but is labeled as entertainment, is often what the average Christian falls prey to. And so we have to be careful that when someone's presenting us with a character who is a type of Messiah, that that's a false Messiah. It's not the true Messiah. And it's put there on a, it's put there for a reason. It's put there to lead us astray. Allowing that media to influence you, to entice you into believing that there are other ways to achieve eternal life. And I, I want to I, I wanna just encourage I mean, anybody that's watching this, that's reading these books or watching these TV shows or movies, 
to understand that, that this is highly dangerous, it's highly addictive, and plus there's a danger of disease. You know, I mean, a lot of these, you know, diseases are blood-borne, the most obvious one being AIDS, you know. So stay away from them, come to Christ. Yeah.